Hello and welcome to York Mansion House's vlog. I'm Dr Annie Gray. Today I'm going to be cooking a classic 18th century recipe, back from the time when Mansion House was new and shiny. Unfortunately, I won't be using the Georgian kitchen for obvious reasons, but, well, I'm doing it in my own home. If you do want to try it, it's an ideal recipe for Easter, and don't worry, I'll be showing you how. This plant is called tansy. It's a kind of invasive weed, quite frankly, but it was known in the past as a strewing herb, or sometimes a bitter herb. It was often strewn around houses in order to keep them sweet smelling, and it was also used for embalming. Although I'm going to use a little bit of tansy in this recipe, we would advise that if you decide to do this at home, that you stick to using other herbs, such as sorrel or spinach. Tansy can be toxic for some people, and in large quantities, it really isn't a very good idea to eat it. In the past, only a very small quantity would have been eaten, and in fact, I'm only going to use about four or five leaves. Tansy comes up in the garden around mid to late March, meaning that it's one of the very few flavours available to the Easter cook. The name comes from the medieval French, or indeed the Latin, and seems to be related to long-lasting. The flowers certainly bloom for ages, and even the leaves last for a very long time. It's related, therefore, to the circle of life, and it's for that reason, along with its seasonality, that it eventually came to give its name to an Easter dish, tansy. There are loads of different recipes for tansy. Some are done in pastry, some are boiled, some are baked, some are more like omelettes. However, they all contain eggs, which of course are another food associated with Easter, and they all contain cream. I'm using a recipe from Elizabeth Moxon's English Huswifery, which was published in Leeds in 1758. So, now to make the tansy. First of all, the key ingredient for tansy itself. We won't use too much because it is very, very strong. Just a few sprigs into a pestle and mortar. And then we're going to add in some spinach. This is a really good use for all the leftover leaves in the garden, the ones that are a bit sort of manky. Uh, then some sorrel as well. And a little bit of good King Henry. Really, what you want is anything that's green and has a really good flavour to it. We're going to pound those down. I'm going to add just a tiny bit of hot water to help the chlorophyll, the green colour, to really come out. If you don't have a really big, strong, tough pestle and mortar like this, you can just use big bowl, the end of a rolling pin. You could even try using a plastic bag and just squishing it all like that. Somehow I kind of think the joy though lies in being violent. Once we get to this point where we've got quite a lot of good green mushed down stuff we're going to decant this into some butter muslin and then squeeze and just see what happens here's the exciting bit eighteenth century food colouring of course Absolutely everything that I touch now will be green. But the main thing is that we really do have quite a lot of green food colouring. This recipe calls for a biscuit base. It specifies biscuits without seeds because an awful lot of biscuits in the past came with caraway seeds in. They're great for dunking into tea, but they do tend to add a certain flavour to things. So I'm using some lady fingers. They are of somewhat indeterminate age, I do have to admit, uh, but sell-by dates didn't exist in the past, 
So I think we're all right. We need to crush these up. The ideal biscuit for this would be something like a macaroon or an amaretti biscuit, either something with almonds in or something that's a sort of sponge biscuit. I wouldn't necessarily recommend using the digestive from the back of the cupboard, but on the other hand, you can try. Obviously, I'd love to tell you how many biscuits to use, but since the recipe doesn't say, I'm afraid to say you're just going to have to do as I did and guess. Next up, half a pint of cream. Curiously, this is a measurement which the recipe does give. I say curiously because it doesn't give any other measurements at all. But that's not unusual for 18th century recipes. They really do rely on the cooks to use their instinct and their experience to get the best possible result. Next up, sugar to taste. I don't have a particularly sweet tooth. So I think that's enough. Then we're going to go for a crucial flavour, very much of the 18th century, and that is orange flower water. It smells like facial toner, which is not surprising because it does make a very, very good toner for the face. It was also used as perfume in the past. Dancing girls used to dab it behind their ears and it does smell absolutely exquisite. Don't use too much, otherwise you're going to end up smelling like a really dodgy perfume shop. Now, the eggs. Eggs were smaller in the past, so for those of you who read the recipe and went, oh my goodness, a nine egg pudding, we can't possibly do that, do not worry. Even if you were making the full amount of your tansy, you'd probably still only use four or five eggs, depending on the size of them. I've actually halved the recipe, so I'm going to use uh, two whole eggs and then one egg white. Now I'm going to add some grated nutmeg. Another really typical Georgian flavour. And finally, my tansy juice. Let's give this a stir. It looks sort of like green porridge. We need to just thicken that up. So I'm going to use some flour. About probably two or three tablespoons. I'm trying to get this to the texture of pancake mixture, so sort of double cream texture, really. Unfortunately, whisks hadn't yet been invented in the 1780s, or at least not decent ones. You could get birch twig whisks, which tend to leave bits of twig in your mixture, or you could use chocolate whisks, which look like a cog on the end of a stick, or you could, well, use a pudding stick, which is what this is. You might be thinking it's a porridge spurtle, but to me, cooking in the 18th century, it's a pudding stick. Right, that looks splendid. So the next thing to do is to cook it. 
Now it's time to fry our tansy. I'm using this very Georgian induction hob, uh, but to be honest, it's probably a little bit better than the Georgian equivalent, which was the charcoal chafing stove. They tended to give off carbon monoxide fumes and so slowly poison the cook. We won't go there. However, I'm gonna use this and a small non-stick frying pan. Again, that's because it goes on induction hobs. So we will fire it up. Now the recipe does suggest that you should be very careful not to brown the bottom. And I am a little bit worried because this is quite a fierce hob. But we'll put in our mixture. I'm going to cook it a little bit like an omelette. So I'm going to keep it moving around as much as possible until the very last minute. And the secret, as with so many things in life, is a lot of butter. What I really need now is a salamander. It's a sort of 18th century version of a cook's blowtorch where you bung an enormous lump of metal into the fire and heat it up and then hold it over the top just to brown it. I could use a cook's blowtorch but I could also just practice patience. Whatever you do, don't try and flip it like a pancake. You will end up with bits of cake crumb absolutely everywhere and green stuff splurged all over every cloth and every single person around. And yes, I am speaking from experience there. Now, even I am not going to try and claim that this looks particularly appetising by modern standards, but we should not judge by modern standards. We should judge by the 18th century. And that's pretty cool. I mean, it's green and it's kind of funky and omelette-y and I mean, how could you not want to eat that? Right, well, I do, so I'm going to serve it up on this rather gorgeous plate. Like so. Nudge it in. And then I think it needs to be garnished. So in the proper style of the 18th century, some orange slices. And there we go. A perfect dish for a Georgian Easter. Right, well, having spent most of the day cooking this thing, I'm quite eager to try and eat it. Sprinkled with sugar. Squeeze of orange juice. And let's dig in. Hmm, it is actually really nice. I shouldn't sound surprised, but I know how old the loaded fingers were. Well, happy Easter from York's Mansion House. And if you decide to try this at home, or indeed a variant on it, then do let us know and send us all of your pictures. Thank you very much for watching.